In human resource management and employing people in any organisation, the moral hazard problem is a profoundly challenging one. Just to recap, moral hazard is effectively uh, the situation where people's behaviour changes in response to incentive structures which give them some guarantee. So in this case, if people don't think they can readily be fired, the moral hazard concept would suggest that people might slacken off, they might lose motivation. So organisations, we're talking mostly here about businesses, need to maintain a series of mechanisms to try and encourage staff to keep their motivation up, to develop their skills, to act in a way which align with the interests of the business. Of course, that's profit making, or in the case of a university, of course, it's educational um, and research missions. Now, there are various things that in practice help to attenuate moral hazard. First of all, human beings are social creatures. So some people are completely shameless or indifferent to the opinion of others. Most people have a regard for their social standing. So peer pressure matters quite significantly. The flip side, ostracism, kind of murahachibu in Japanese, of, of being excluded or, or um, being made friendless or no one talking to you or whatever, is a, a very powerful and quite traumatic experience for people. So the fear of being left out if one is not a performer or, or you know, contributing in a, in a fair way to the team is a significant constraint on people. Um, of course, economists tend to focus more on the economic incentives that can be offered uh, for people to align their actions, interests with those of the company and particularly the owners of the company, the shareholders. So the economists tend to focus on the, the kind of financial incentives that might be paid, performance bonuses, for example. Sales staff, particularly sales staff who are out in the field, uh, who are very difficult to monitor, very difficult to check what they're actually doing when they're out all day seeing their visiting clients. Very often sales staff get a substantial part of their pay tied to their uh, sales bonus, their performance bonus. So if they hit certain sales targets, they're more heavily rewarded. Indeed, sometimes sales staff work almost completely on commission. So they uh, are like a free agent effectively, where the money they earn is a function of literally how many sales they make. We see many people, of course, working now in the gig economy, whether it's Uber Eats, for example, or whatever, are effectively working on a uh, piece rates, what we call piece rates approach of where they get paid a percentage or a flat rate per job. So they have powerful incentives, of course, to maximize their work. That also helps to explain why so many Uber Eats drivers are uh, riders are so impatient waiting to pick up orders, for example, even if you're, if you're in McDonald's because they want to get the delivery done and they want to get the next one um, because that's where their, their income um, comes from. But there are a lot of non-financial ways, of course, which companies, organisations can encourage staff to perform effectively to overcome this moral hazard problem, giving people simply more rewarding work. Uh, or the, uh, the more desirable parts of the work. You know, a large car manufacturer, for example, has everything from after-sales service through to the, the design function, the market research function, for example. True car lovers really would like to be involved in, for example, product development. So there is quite significant internal competition for the more interesting roles in an organisation even if the pay scale doesn't change at all. Of course, transfers, sending people to less desirable locations can be a means of disciplining staff. So there are many things, if you think about, um, uh, that organisations can use to reward staff uh, that don't actually add up to larger costs for the organisation. The shot you know, the, uh, the President's Award, for example, various citations, commendations uh, that give recognition uh, for high performance. These are potentially attractive to employees too. Of course, it increases their own stature inside the organisation. If they're applying for promotion, it can support their case. But also if they're looking to leave the organisation, these become valuable things that they can use too. They can put them on this CV, their direction, in order 
to clearly demonstrate uh, that they have been performing effectively. They're not just making those claims, because everyone will say that they're performing effectively um, if they are looking to uh, get a new job. So in some circumstances where actually employees are more likely to change jobs, the moral hazard issue is less of a problem for companies for the very simple reason that employees are almost aggressively seeking growth opportunities, opportunities to perform, because they can then take that the evidence of that performance, if it can be evidenced, and this is the critical thing, if it can be evidenced, take the evidence of that performance and use it to actually promote themselves either inside the company or outside the company to a potential employer. Now, finally, an observation about universities, seeing you, you're all university students, and uh, you may be wondering about how does the moral hazard problem get dealt with in universities, particularly with the phenomena of what we call academic tenure. So academic tenure is guaranteed employment for professorial staff, academic staff, uh, effectively until retirement age, once they've met certain performance requirements. For example, they have a research track record and whatnot. Well, actually, the interesting thing is that for the most part, academics show that the moral hazard problem is a little bit too simplistic. That actually many people who become academics, the uh, ultimately a professor, but they start off as a lecturer, for example, um, have a very high level of intrinsic motivation to do research in a certain area. And very significantly, their primary identity is not with their employer so much is more with their disciplinary field. The international community of scholars uh, whose good opinion they care for. So if you are in the field of psychology, for example, in the subfield of psychology, publishing in certain journals, collaborating with certain famous researchers can be career high points. Uh, in many ways, the concern for reputation in the wider uh, professional domain, the academic field of knowledge, leads to academics having very strong incentives to perform quite regardless of what their organisation does, quite regardless of what their home university does. The other side of the coin though, uh, this is uh, a job that has several roles, the research, it has the teaching and it has the administration. Generally, of course, anywhere, people are trying to get out of the administration as much as possible. They would much rather be doing their research or, or their teaching. The teaching, hmm, the teaching is something, to be honest, I'm sorry to tell you, is less saleable in the labour market. In my country, in Australia, when you're applying for a, uh, an academic job in another university, you have to really demonstrate teaching performance student appraisals, uh, a whole range of things. In Japan and in many university systems, it's rather more common that the primary criteria for hiring an academic staff member is their research track record. Now, increasingly, and, and SILS does this, uh, they do ask academics to deliver a small model lecture, for example, to see that they've got some basic skill set. But for the most part, the rewards uh, for academics are primarily in the research domain rather than the teaching domain. Not always. Some institutions have, have a very strong culture of teaching and they want to recognise that as well. Some liberal arts colleges, as I said, Australian universities very much emphasise this as well. Uh, although for the more senior staff members to get above a certain level, senior lecturer and above, for example, one needs to really have that research track record. So there is a broader lesson here, not just from universities, but in any organisation, that uh, the kinds of things that get measured, that can be measured, and which can be recognised and rewarded, tend to attract more effort by employees. So some of the biggest problems in any organisation are coming up with the metrics, the measures, uh, the means of assessing 
uh, desirable behaviors, outcomes, attributes, employees that the organization wants to encourage, but which are actually rather difficult to measure. So empathy, kindness, regard for your fellow employees, for, for students, for example, in the university. These are things that are actually not so easy to measure and therefore to manage for, therefore to incentivize. So generally organizations are trying to develop more sophisticated means of measuring the performance of their employees to then think about how they could create incentives to encourage the behaviors, the mindsets, the values they want those employees to have. Ultimately, particularly in labor markets where people change jobs, Tenshock fairly regularly, um, people will be looking to build their CV to get evidence of their performance and to use that to sell themselves outside the organization. So in so far as what sells outside the firm also makes the firm or the organization, the university, a better organization, moral hazard issues are not such a problem. It's when they diverge, it becomes quite problematic. The professor, for example, who only cares about his research and really doesn't care about the teaching or the administration because the university doesn't reward or punish uh, good or bad performance. Um, I'm sure you've all got some views on those issues. But uh, what we see in the university is just part of a broader problem in so many um, organisations of trying to measure comprehensively good behaviour by an employee and to reward that and to make sure therefore that uh, the actions, the behaviours, the mindsets of employees are aligned with the goals of the organisation.